Uh, so I enjoyed the movie so much. And um, I'm curious for you, what, what appealed to you about this project? What, what, what got you into Cruella? I think, you know, I'd seen uh, 101 Dalmatians as a kid. So I, I was aware of the story and I'd seen the movie with Glenn Close. So I was kind of, I knew about it. But what I thought was really fascinating was that they were going for the origins element of it. And I thought, because where do you take a, a, an evil character like that? the best way is from the beginning, because what that does is it allows her to be evil by the end, but actually you sympathize with her because you've seen what a difficult life she's had, you know, her difficult family life and uh, you know, how she's been kind of, you know, not, not being given the opportunities that she's wanted. So I loved, I thought that angle was really cool. Nice. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> um, and you know, you were a kid in London in the seventies. Uh, did, yeah. did this take you back to transport yeah. you? Yeah, I mean, seeing those cars, seeing those baggy trousers, you know, just brought it all back to me. And I was kind of a punk in the 77. So the punky vibe was uh, fascinating to see as well. Yeah, it took me right back. Amazing. I hope there are pictures of that. <laughs> <laughs> there are somewhere, but they're under lock and key. Okay, yeah, that's too bad. <laughs> and um, there are a lot of dogs in this movie. Was that difficult to, to work with animals? No. Well, they say, don't they, that working with children yeah. and animals is difficult. And of course, the first part I do is with the, the young Cruella and her dog. Um, but no, because they're incredibly well trained. I don't know if you know this, but the Dalmatians were real. They're not CGI. Yeah. And when they when they walk, they had little marks. The trainers would put these little pads, these little round pad, pads down on the ground and the dogs would stop on them. They were incredibly well trained. And actually having a, a dog on set is, is just makes the whole thing much more fun anyway. Yeah, a little more joyous. I love that. Um, yeah. So I love that you play a lot of sinister people. My personal favorite is Septimus from Stardust. Oh. And, um, but you also play warm really well. And I enjoyed that in this movie. You're kind of a mystery. We don't really know, um, you know, which side you're going to land on. And uh, do you have a preference? Did you enjoy playing kind of both sides? I, I think, well, I know I enjoy playing the villains more. I mean, it, it, that's the truth of it. And that's probably why I've played so many, not, not necessarily because they're, <clears throat> excuse me, not because they're villains, but because they're interesting. You know, th those are the most colorful characters in the script. If you look at Blackwood in Sherlock Holmes or I don't know, uh, uh, Frank D'Amico in Kick-Ass or, or Godfrey in Robin Hood, you know, they're really colorful characters. They get great costumes, they get great lines. And, um, you know, they're really good fun to play. And, and importantly, and I, I've said this to your colleagues, is um, you get to kind of be what you're not in real life. If you play a hero and you're warm and friendly and lovely and kind, I mean, you can do that every day. I mean, I do that every day. I don't know about <laughs> you. But you don't get to sort of, you know, plumb the rage, the depth, mm -hmm. the anger, all of that kind of stuff. And so it's fun, you know, it's fun being a villain in fiction. Absolutely. So that's a great segue because I am from comicbook.com. So I obviously have to bring up Shazam. Yeah. Uh, and are we going to see you in that sequel? You're not going to see me in the sequel. Oh, no. that is I'm really finally, cool. I'm finally allowed to say it. I've had oh. to sort of bite, bite my tongue for so long, but I think they're about to start filming in um, Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And I'm very happy to give way to Helen Mirren and Lucy Liu, who okay. I think are going to make a couple of fantastic villains and i mean judging by the performances by emma thompson and emma stone in cruella it's time for the female villains i think i can't argue that i'm i'm, I'm bummed but I, but you make a good point so that's yeah right. well you know maybe he's got unfinished with mr mind and we'll be back further down the line who knows okay i love that tease um shazam <laughs> i think shazam is one of the best family holiday movies made of the last decade i think it's going to become like a christmas time staple do you yeah. as somebody who's in the movie and made the movie do you see it that way do you think of it as a holiday movie yeah, because I think it's so much fun. You know, my, my boys absolutely loved that film and all their pals just thought it was great. And it's got, you know, Zach has got such an irrepressible sort of sense about him that it's just, it's very watchable. And um, all the boys in it were great, all the, all the family, you know, they were, they were fantastic. So it's got those, those cozy, you know, it's got family values, it's got good over evil, it's got everything you kind of want from that kind of a movie. And actually the only one that I can think of that I would say is in the same League is, is the one you mentioned earlier, which is Stardust, which yes. is a fantastic movie. One of my favorite movies of all time. Yeah, me too. It's such a great film. I love it. Uh, going back to Cruella a bit, you had mentioned fashion. And um, I think you got the short end of the stick a little in this movie. Like there is a lot <laughs> of good fashion, um, but you're mostly just suiting it. Were you a little jealous or was it kind of freeing? You didn't have to worry about all any 
kind of extravagant outfits. No, I was fine with it because I tell you what, I, I wore the quality of the clothing was fantastic. I just had that one costume. I didn't have to do any costume changes. Every time I finished a scene with Emma Thompson and we'd move on to another one, she'd have to go off somewhere and get into another corset and another phenomenal dress, but then another pair of high heels and come out again. It was exhausting for her, I think, but she carried it off so brilliantly. But I was, I was happy just to have my traditional British butler valet outfit. Good. It works. Um, and so finally, you know, you've been talking about Cruella all day. Um, is there anything about your experience or about the movie that you haven't gotten to talk about that you've been, been dying to share? Um, I, well, no, because my, 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 my nugget of joy was the fact that I gave, I gave one of the tracks because it has the most kicking soundtrack. This Amazing film, soundtrack. Just absolutely brilliant. But I suggested one of the tracks to Craig and I think he's admitted and, or, or, or confessed that one of the tracks I, I, I uh, came up with, which was the I Can Tina Turner cover of Whole Lot of Love, you know, the Led Zeppelin track, because I was, I just thought it would work. And Craig said to me at the time when I suggested, he went, do you know what? Actors are always suggesting things to me and it never, ever works. And this time it did. Um, that's not a unique thing that I'm telling you, unfortunately. I have mentioned that before and, and Craig's mentioned it, but I think it's maybe one of the things that I'm, I'm quite proud of because it meant I really, I, I just got, I understood where he was going with the, with the movie. Yeah, that's great. I think that's fun. And, and, and like, a, you know, a fun little brag, you should tell everybody about that. <laughs> yeah. Why not I'm, get it out? I'm not offended that I wasn't the first. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I enjoyed the movie so much and, uh, uh, and uh, I'm going to leave upset and sad that I won't see you in the new Shazam, but I, I'm going to watch you in the first one every Christmas. So. Oh, thank you. That's so kind. <laughs> like Emma Stone, you're playing a character who exists in the original, but unlike Emma, you didn't have as much personality to work with. Anita's not the most thrilling person. Yeah. I mean, what's interesting is I've just obviously been doing all these interviews and, and Paul was talking about this. He was like, you know, for their character, for Paul and Joel's character of Jasper and Horace, there wasn't a lot of meat on the bone is how is how Paul described it. So they kind of had to build. And I feel similarly to Anita. It's like we've, we have definitely seen Anita. There's no shortage of her in any of the stories. But I think we see kind of one side of her. We see her as this very kind, gentle mother, homemaker figure. And I think in some ways, actually, that was beneficial to me because I got to make Anita the way I wanted her to be. I, I wasn't trying to uh recreate anything that i had ever seen before i got to go who is this anita for this generation and who is anita to me mm -hmm. awesome it worked wonderfully um, the the first time she's introduced in the movie though she's played by um the younger actor and did you get to meet your younger self was it weird? i did and we had a photo together and i will tell you the highest praise is that my mom looked at the photo and she was like my, when my mom watched the film she goes they did a really good job oh. she, when you were a kid, which is so cool. Cause you know, when you watch films sometimes and you're like, no way, but she like, I think it's kind of uncanny. I have to find some pictures of myself at that age. Oh but yeah. Really and she's so, she was so sweet and such a great, she's such a great actress. Oh yeah. We need to get to social media and do some side by side. <laughs> yeah, <we need> to. <laughs> Amazing. And um, in the movie, uh, Kayvon Novak plays Roger, but yeah. you know, you don't, you know, it's not your time yet. Uh, no. to, to meet and be romantic but you know there is we do know that there's a there's a future romance between you did you guys meet did they did they want to test to see if you could be it or not at all never met the man never met him on set never saw roger even in passing i don't think we did a single day together so it's kind of like true to the story anita has never met roger and kirby oh. has never met Kayvan. so i love that it's like sad but also kind of Perfect. Because kind of I also think it's like, we really don't know where the story will go from here. Like if it does continue, they've left it so open that it's like if, if, and when they do meet, we have no idea how it will happen. So uh -huh. I, I like it. I, I can't wait. I, I hope the chemistry is there. I bet it is. I can, I can tell. <laughs> oh God, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you would be open to returning, doing, doing your own 101 Dalmatians maybe version. I would love to return. I mean, for me, it, I got to work on a really great film with incredible costumes, incredible set design and really lovely actors. And, and, and that's kind of all you can hope for. I kind of like, I, I won. So yeah, why? who would not want to come back for more of that? Agreed. And, and you're from London, but you missed the 70s. You weren't around then. I wasn't uh, around in the 70s, but I'm from London. What, what, what was it like to step into that era from like an area, you know, but of a different time period? Well, what's interesting is like, I, I live 
probably like half an hour from the West End. So I'm so familiar with Liberty and all of that. But I think what was more helpful than just being from London was my mum. Obviously, she was around in the 70s and she is into fashion and things like that. So seeing it through her eyes, like when I, especially when I watched the film, her being so transported back in, in what she saw and seeing not just Liberty in the seventies and being in that, that being how she remembered it, but also seeing the double decker buses that were open and things like that. Like that was really exciting to me to go, Oh, there are people who will watch this film who were there at that time and can really revel in the, in the nostalgia. Amazing. Um, when I when I saw you in this movie, I got so excited. I had one of the, the Leo meme moment because you're in so many shows that I love. Oh. And uh, it was and so I switching gears a little. I got to ask if we're going to see you in the third season of Barry. You know, I so Barry, that's such a I mean, the, the short answer is yes, hopefully. But we were due to start filming the next season of Barry when the pandemic hit. So they went into sort of like a bunker and wrote the next season, like they, they, they started the season and then continued from there. But I also think that things have probably had to change. So I am very close with that whole team and definitely want to come back and they know that. And I, and I am almost positive that I, that I am coming back, but it's really up in the air because so much has had to change because of schedules and what we went through and things like that. Uh, uh, everybody- well, it's a great, I mean, what a great crew. An amazing show. I, uh, uh, and speaking of amazing shows, I'm going to bring up The Good Place. Please, I love The Good Place. <laughs> so we know, okay, Simone dies in a hilarious way, but we don't know what. Do you know how she dies? Have Did you like, did, were you given that information? I was not given that information. And actually what's really fun is there's like so few surprises as an actor because you read every script and you're, you know, you see everything. And even when you're watching films, you like know how it's done because you're there. Right. So you're like, Oh yeah, I can see that that extra was told to walk across there and things like that. So for me, not knowing how she dies and just me trying to like piece it together is like one of the, some of the few mysteries that are left. Oh, nice. So you didn't like make it up in your mind. You just, I have made, I have my thoughts of how she died in a hilarious way. I guess I've just had nights of thinking about what would be the funniest way to die. Um, but I think that it's really fun. I, I don't have a definitive answer. Maybe I should actually text someone and ask them. <laughs> <laughs> like maybe no one has it. Maybe they were just like, uh, hilarious way. And no one- I, <laughs> I do like the idea of you knowing, but then just keeping it to yourself though. Uh, That's what we're going to do. I'm going to text someone to figure it out and then I'll keep it to myself. Yes. <laughs> I love it. Um, and so we have a lot of infinity train fans at comicbook.com. Oh, and yes. I- I'm so ashamed to say I have, I have not watched it yet. It's, uh, it's so high on my list. Everyone loves it so much. So I um, asked my coworker and friend, Aaron, um, uh, if there were any good infinity train questions for you. And oh. this, is what, um, this is what I got. Okay. Um, and, and so in book three, you played grace as the uh, protagonist and how did the balance, um, cause she, start the darkness where she started in the season versus where she comes out in the end how was it for you to play that arc well actually i'm so glad you mentioned that because i have been saying for the longest time like i want to play a bad character i want to play like an evil character and actually i guess i've already had a bit of a chance of that in grace i mean i don't think she's like similar similarly to cruella she's absolutely not rotten to her core and i think she is also in this nature nurture battle right she's trying to you know, she's a certain way. And then uh, I don't want to spoil things, but someone comes into her life and sort of changes her perspective. But for me, what was really fun was I didn't know where that character would go. So at first she was just kind of like manipulative and conniving. And I got to lean into that. And then seeing her grow was so fun and, and, and having that, that flip, but also it felt really exciting to be part of something that is for kids, but didn't talk down to kids, which I hope also Cruella is like that, right? Like it's a oh, yeah. That it was the idea of it was, you know, it's a, it's a kid's movie, but it's absolutely not. And, you know, kids have the Internet now. They're so smart. You can't pull down to them. It's true. <laughs> and, and so you've been talking about Cruella all day. Um, is there anything about your experience uh, uh, making the movie that you haven't gotten to share that uh, that you would love to talk about? What have I not got to share? Um you know, I don't know if I have, for me, it was like, it was, it was such a joy to film in London. I don't know if I've like expressed that enough. I love, I work a lot here in the U S and it was really, really nice, not just to shoot in London, but to shoot on location in London. Cause I was, you know, I would spend days in places that 
I know like the back of my hand, but I got to see in a completely different way and got to experience in a really different way. And that kind of gives you like a greater appreciation of your home and where you're from. And that was, that was really, really nice and something that I'll forever be grateful for. This is the the third feature um, to have Jasper and Horace in it, but it's really the first time that the characters get to be flushed out and, and uh, have a little backstory. Did you guys pull any inspiration from the cartoon or the 96 movie? Uh, <laughs> we're laughing because we've been asked this question quite a bit. Oh, no. It, no, 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 it's fine. It's just funny because we went back and watched the animated feature and there's not a lot of meat on that bone. There's not much <laughs> to take from. So I, I just was, I was ripping off Bob Hoskins voice from the movie hook. Yeah. Uh, that, was, that was my inspiration for Horace personally. Yeah. Oh, I didn't look back at any of those. No, I didn't, didn't try nothing. I, I just thought about the thin arms and legs and yes. the fact that Jasper was kind of didn't have much patience for Horace's talking. And that's kind of a bit from it, really. Okay. And that's how Joel feels about me as well. So it kind of worked. The perfect yeah. dynamic. I love that. Uh, Joel, uh, you know, you're so endearing as Jasper. It was, it was almost jarring because you're not, you're not used to that for that character. And you kind of had me shipping him with Cruella. Uh, and I'm, I, so I sense romantic feelings is, uh, no. what is shipping? What's this word shipping? I heard this twice now. Is that an American? Is that an yeah, American? That you're rooting for them as a couple. Um, and oh. which obviously, um, uh, but shipping, does shipping mean specifically in like a romantic way? Yes. Yes. Uh, no, no, <laughs> it's like a family. They're like surrogate family. And I guess without being too serious, right. At that moment, well, those moments, Cruella in, or Estella, in one way, is just kind of losing her mind, I guess. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it's just like a family way of trying to bring someone back. Really. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, like that as, I like that assertion, though. Like, the idea of them together is like a... I, I think you guys are a match made in heaven. You're like <laughs> Bill and, you're like Bill and Melinda Gates. <laughs> no. <laughs> Oof, okay. Well, Paul... Oh, so funny. Um, you, 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 okay. You had some fun scenes with that dog. It was so cute. Uh, what was it like to work with him? Uh, challenging. Um, That dog was heavily sedated. No, I'm kidding. Um, (laughs) the dog, the dog was adorable and I love animals. I love dogs. So it was a joy just to be around them. But there, there were quite a few takes where the dogs, didn't always do what they were paid to do. And that's when we had to kind of CGI some stuff, but, uh, but yeah, it was, it was fun. They would feed the dog little bits of chicken and ham and they would give it little treats, like a lot of incentivizing to get it to do what you want it to do. Of course. Even then, like there were times where I'm like, I basically gave this dog a whole rotisserie chicken the last hour and it still hasn't jumped off the ledge. We're still waiting for it to come down. Oh, no. So, uh, yeah, it was tough sometimes, but but it was fun. I, I liked it. But I just remembered again. So I'm getting flashbacks as we're doing this because it feels like it was a decade ago, but it wasn't. I remember you in the back of the car with like I don't know how many Dalmatians <laughs> were in the car with you. But all I look back and all I could see was kind of Paul's eye like that, and just the rest of it was just Dalmatian like crushed all around him. And didn't it like scratch up your chest? Oh no, it kind of yeah, scratched. Her- no, it hurt like hell. There was a Dalmatian that stepped right on my groin. Uh, and these are like heavy dogs. And when they step on you, you feel it. So I remember being in the back seat, being like, I hate this. This is the worst thing ever. Oh, no. Oh, well, it, it looked good. It came together at least. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well. There, there are obviously some setups in this movie uh, for the future for 101 Dalmatians. Would, would you guys want to return and tell that story? Or is it a little too much you'd have to want to skin some puppies? I would be, I'd be into it. Would you do it? I, I don't know. Do you think, you think it's setting it up for 101 Dalmatians, do you? Well, there was a, yeah, there was a mid credit scene that alluded to the future. Right. Yeah, I mean, I don't really, I, I guess it could be, but it could also just set up for another Cruella film, I think, personally. Mm, okay. um, but, be that. but yeah, I don't know, see how the future goes, right? We might all be dead tomorrow. 
Well, that's true. That's a great answer. Um, I'm hoping it goes Cruella, Cruella 2, even more cruel, Ella. And then uh, and then 101 Dalmatians is like the third in the trilogy. Yeah, get the cinematic universe going. I love that. By that point, point, we're all like, hey, Horace, where you going, Horace? (laughs) You're like, hey, (laughs) Jasper. So switching gears you, just a little Do you little plan bit. to be a senior citizen in the next five years? What are you what are you talking about? Oh God. All right. I, I want to switch gears a little bit, um, because Paul, you were in one of my favorite movies of last year, which was Defy Five Bloods. Um, and I, I'm curious uh, just what that experience was like and if you got to meet Chadwick Bozeman at all. You know what? I, I, I enjoyed that, that process because I love Spike and it was, it was an important story to tell. But um, it was also pretty grueling. The, the weather was quite hot, lots of bugs, a lot of the crew didn't speak English. And I ended up getting a bacterial infection and going to the hospital the last week of filming. Oh, gosh. It was pretty exhausting, but um, I'm proud of the movie. And the only time I saw Chadwick was at a party that Spike threw at this like restaurant bar place. And it was kind of like a midway party to kind of break up the shoot for everybody. And Chadwick was there, but I remember him looking really gaunt, really thin and depleted of energy, kind of like this at a table and at times kind of resting his head on his arms. And so I didn't even walk up and say hello because he just looked so tired. I didn't want to bother him, but, um, eternally grateful that I got to share the screen with him to some degree. And, uh, and he's left us quite a legacy that Disney's keeping alive with black Panther. It's exciting. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, jo- Joel, I think my bosses would kill me if I didn't bring up game of Thrones. <laughs> um, and I just, I want to know uh, if uh, you were bummed that Daenerys didn't make, didn't win because you kind of died for it. Uh, well, didn't win the Game of Thrones. Yeah, she didn't end up on the throne. I mean, uh, well, she did though, didn't she? But no. kind of, well, Wait a I don't know, man. I mean, I didn't. I, I think. I think I. I think I left it emptied out of my head by that point. You were over uh, it by then. Yeah, I think I'd forgotten all about it by then. All right. That's fair. Um, just switching back. You guys have been talking about Cruella all day. Is there anything you've wanted to talk about that you haven't gotten to share about your experience making Cruella? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, you're drained. You've talked about everything. Um, nobody, nobody's asked us what our favorite movies are. Nobody asked us, like, what's on our DVD shelf. All no right, one- what's your favorite movie? I'd love, to, I'd love to know that. Joel, you go first. Uh, probably Brazil. Okay. What a hip, cool answer. <laughs> Everybody's going to read that and go, damn, Joel Fry is one cool guy. <laughs> and I'm going to look really uncool with my choice. I'm going to look cheesy. Let's hear it. It's a wonderful life. Oh, that's a lovely answer. <sighs> <laughs> Well, uh, I can definitely see this Jasper and Horace dynamic working in real life. No wonder you had such good chemistry on screen. Uh, Thank you guys uh, so much for talking to me. I really enjoyed the movie. So earlier today, um, during press press conference, Emma Stone mentioned that the movie took a really long time to get made. And I'm curious how far into the process that did you sign on to direct? Was it already written at that point when you got involved? They they had been developing it for about four or five years. And... um, then I got a call from from Sean at Disney, Sean, um, and he said, "Do you want it? Are you interested in Cruella with uh, Emma Stone, set in 1970s London, punk?" And I said, like, "I'm very intrigued <laughs> by that." And then they did send the script along, and the script had some really some great devices in it, some great structure to it, and a great a great overall story going on. But totally, it wasn't where I, I wanted to be. And uh, so when I came on, I guess it, came, it, it then came together quickly because Emma and I sat down and talked and she'd worked with uh, Tony McNamara on The Favourite. I was working on a project with him at the time. We both were like, all right, let's have Tony. And Tony was up for doing it. So he did a pass on it. And that's when it really came alive for me because that totally we really connected. And 
and just that that just that crackling dialogue and banter and just and he really pitted the two women to go head to head and made it very much their story uh particularly in the second half and then and then i was like we were off to the races you know yeah. um so beforehand i was curious to see if it would feel more like a prequel to the animated movie or to the 96 version and i, I think it's safe to say it's it's more in line with the animated movie and i'm curious if you went back and and used either for inspiration or the even the book I'm supposed to say yes, right? <laughs> no, you can say what is the truth. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, I really didn't. I wanted to stay away from the Glenn Close version because Emma Stone has to create this character. And I felt like the fact that we're, I, was, I, want, I just wanted to be in it and not, I just stayed away from that. I knew for me, I really wanted to embrace this 1970s gritty London punk version of it. And so we were sort of starting with that and her character had to come out of that. And so, and it, we really had to sort of create it new and create the tone of her. So I didn't look at that at all. And then the crazy thing with 101 Dalmatians, she's such a, a, a delight to watch Corella and you love that she's got, she's got this humor and, and sort of very like, narcissistic, like biting tone to her, but we don't know anything about her. I mean, she went to school <laughs> with Anita and that's about it. So in some ways it's like, remarkably liberating. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, we got to put them in school together. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> and then anything from there to, the, <laughs> to like when she's 50, we kind of open range. <laughs> she likes fashion. So we got to really just sort of discover it. And, and just, again, it's like I'd come off of Itania where I was really excited. I got to like lean into my instincts on Itania and really go for it. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to do it again with this. So I felt like Disney was giving me that opportunity. You know, they wanted, they, they were willing to swing for it on this. And, and so I, I didn't want to disappoint. So, you know, I brought in uh, my uh, Nicholas Katz Katanas who did Aitana with me and Fiona Crombie who had done the favorite. And we kind of assembled this kind of, and, you know, Aunt Tony who'd written that this kind of indie group of us that just was a, like going to just go for it. And it's like, people would come in and be like, okay, don't think of this as a Disney movie. We're making a sort of coming of age, punk rock, 1970s London. Like, don't worry about like thinking of it in, with those parameters. And I think it was really liberating and everybody just got to really go for it. Yeah. Uh, totally. Uh, one thing I was so excited that there were real dogs in this movie. That made me so happy. Was working. It makes with one of us. Right? That's exactly what I was going to ask. Was that was it a struggle to work with the dogs? <laughs> yeah, it's like it's amazing how skittish Dalmatians are. <laughs> <laughs> and then you put three of them in the scene. <laughs> it's like having a hundred cats. Oh no. <laughs> Oh well. Like, yeah, we did, we get like one take with it, with Emma Thompson in a ball gown and Hills trying to come down the stairs holding three Dalmatians on a leash, and it turned into a it turned into a stunt. It would be like, <laughs> okay, that's not safe. We can't do that. We're gonna have to get the dogs out of there. We're gonna do CG dogs. <laughs> Oh, I love that. Right. My, my, my personal favorite moment in the whole movie was the mid credit scene. Um, it just, it brought me so much joy. And so, I, I, you know, it's kind of set up 101 Dalmatians. Have there been any talks of doing a follow-up to Cruella? I was hoping to set it up. So at least we could have that conversation. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> at least like leave, like, it feels like it needs one, doesn't it? Yeah. I'd it's only just become Cruella. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I want to just switch gears real quick because I have you and I'd be remiss if I didn't just bring up Pam and Tommy uh, because these pictures that are coming out are blowing my mind. <laughs> I know it's kind of crazy how that just got attention. They're absolutely, I mean, we're four weeks in and Sebastian and Lily are just killing it. And, you know, we've got Seth in, in there as well and Nick Offerman. And it's a really, really crazy, wild, fun ride that ultimately I, I, what I love about it is it's it, it it has a lot of heart. Again, it has a very similar sensibility to I, Tanya, where you get to go on this journey and, and understand, you know, the damage that was done to Pamela Anderson. And that as an audience, we're again, complicit in this because it's like, you know, we devour all of this without any repercussions for what's happening to the individual. So it's, it sort of does this bait and switch in a way that was really exciting as well, but it's, it's, it's pretty out there. 
That's from <laughs> fictional to real life. I, I love the women that you choose to, to showcase. It's really awesome. Um, uh, so I, we're comicbook.com. So I like to ask a director uh, if there are any superheroes or comic book characters or Star Wars characters that you'd ever want to direct. Uh, I'm very much in a, it's funny. It's a, I'm in the Batman world. It's like, I actually love, I love the, the heroes that are grounded in a certain reality. And obviously Batman is that. Mm -hmm. So I like having those parameters, the physicality of yeah. that. So I'm, you know, big fan of the, obviously the Nolan Batman work that was done. Me, me. So before I let you go, um, you've been talking about Cruella all day. <laughs> Is there anything that you haven't gotten to talk about, about the movie that you, that you, yes. Like you? Okay. <laughs> yes. In fact, uh, Nicholas Bertel's music. Oh, uh, and you know, he said, you know, he's off of succession and the big shot and, just an amazing composer. And the very tricky part of this was, um, you know, we have 48 or 50 songs in this movie that are very, some very iconic songs. And so having to create a score that has to fit in between that and compete with that in a way. And he did this amazing uh, rock score for uh, Corella. And uh, he went back to Abbey road and he scored with old amps and instruments and, uh, at certain points, there's 132 channels on one track. Like wow. that, because he's got orchestra and rock musicians and all playing. It's like the energy and, and that he has to bring to that score and, and the, just the volume to compete with like these iconic rock songs. The soundtrack. So that, <laughs> yeah. So that was like, uh, that was an amazing, and working with him, like, you know, like, you know, at, at, at his place, like on the sofa, like score by score and trying to like create to, to figure this out and really what fits into this film. It's, it's very tricky when you have that much music in there. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for talking to me today. Um, I loved the movie uh, and I can't wait for everybody to see it.